you go. Amen. The sixth seal. Let's look at Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. He says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the, I'm sorry. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Boy, it sounds like the earthquake of earthquakes, doesn't it? And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens, and the rocks, and the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. You see, that's why I believe uh, they will be able to see when heaven opens, and they'll see what's going on. This Amen. is nothing that's hidden here. I right. believe that... Armageddon will be a great military campaign. I don't believe it'll be just within a few seconds and all that. I think a lot of the stuff we've heard is just malarkey. Amen. Verse 17 says, For the great day of His wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? I tell you what, keep your hand there if you would. And let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. And uh, we'll read beginning in verse 10. And look at a prophecy of this very event. Early on, in Isaiah, he deals with the return of the Lord. He begins by saying, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. Now, this is, again, you know, I always like to tie things together so teachings can always remain fresh in our minds. But you see that for the fear of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, well, over in Revelation 6, it was the Lamb. Same person, isn't it? Yep. Amen. Verse 11, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures." And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. Amen. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Isn't that what we've seen in Revelation 6? In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? He's telling them there, in a, in a kind of a general sense, quit looking for the answers in mankind. Amen? They're not there. Um, but then I think specifically, because of the, the fact that this event is prophetic, I think he may be talking a little bit about the man of sin who's sitting in the temple of God as God. Amen? See she from him. You don't follow that mess. Don't follow the spirit of Antichrist. Don't follow the spirit of the world's religions. Cast that off. It's nothing but idols. Boy, you better do it before this event takes place. Amen? Amen. So anyway, that's a little bit about the sixth seal. We see it's at the return or close to the return of Christ. It seems like in Revelation, a lot of these events take place very quickly. Uh, But you can't use the space between two seals or two trumpets to measure the rest of the spaces. 
it's not that uniform. Uh, John is for us just recording what he saw. Amen. We don't know. There could be years between events. Amen. Uh, we do have some hints, uh, some clues in Revelation, and we'll learn more about that as we go through because we are going to look at the trumpets and uh, the vials of wrath the same way we looked at the seals. Maybe not as in much depth, or in much depth because it's, it gets pretty um, self-explanatory. And I think that what you'll find, and, and really put this in your mind, that as we look at these seals, seven of them, seven trumpets and seven vials, I want you to realize that a lot of them are the same event. A lot of them are the same event. It's just that it um, there's a different point of view, and I'll show you why I believe that. Amen. Um, anyway, I don't believe that uh, the teachings of the dispensationalist. I don't believe that first you have seven seals, and then that begets telescopes into uh, seven trumpets, and then that telescopes into seven vials of wrath. I don't believe that. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, because number one, as you read through the book of Revelation, you get into a state of extreme confusion if you believe that. That's right. I mean extreme confusion. Yes. You, and, and have you ever noticed that most people don't preach on Revelation except for key little texts? Yep. Most pastors don't teach through it. Uh, there are many commentaries available on Revelation. But they kind of just teach concepts of things that are distant. Mm -hmm. Things that you don't really have to worry about. Because after all, uh, you were raptured out before any of these take place. Well, I, I think that we saw um, in the last few weeks that the seven seals uh, have, at least at some level, already taken place. Amen. Amen. And I believe we're going to learn more about how to interpret these. And, and my goal today is to kind of show you from Scripture why I believe that these all overlap each other at some level. And they all kind of just intermingle at some level. And I'm going to show you where I think that is. Now that may change as we get deeper, I'll be honest with you. I, I've read and studied the book of Revelation my whole ministry but especially in the last five or six years. And I'm, man, I just picked up the Bible this morning and found something else out I didn't realize before. So it, I have to, please be patient with me. It is a kind of an ongoing growth for me as well. Amen. There's just so much in this book. But if, if we can understand what I'm teaching you this morning about these seals, trumpets, and vials, I think that the rest of Revelation will come in order for us. And when it comes to matters of timing and uh, the specifics, I think we'll have a better understanding. Amen. Yeah. And, of course, if you think it's gobbledygook and I'm crazy and I'm wrong, well, fine, just turn off the recording. Amen. We'll go on. I'll be happy. You be happy. Let's just move on. All right. So I want to talk about the timing of the sixth seal the timing of the sixth seal, especially as it correlates to the trumpets and the vials. Amen? Uh, the first thing, I do not believe in the dispensationalist model, like, like I said there. I, I, I don't believe it. It leads to extreme confusion, which we will find out as we study. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that this morning. And it focuses and forces a rapture into the text, into the, into the dialogue. Amen? If you remember over there in uh, chapter 4, after he talks to the churches, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was uh, as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. 
And they use that verse to teach that there's a rapture that takes place. If that's true, I want you to know it's not only a mystery, as they say, but it completely contradicts every other record concerning Christ and His return. 1 Corinthians 5, at the last trump. Amen. Well, we haven't even got to a trumpet yet in Revelation. Amen. Um, Acts chapter 1. Where the angels told the Lord, told the men that were watching the Lord, go up, why stand ye here gazing? He says, don't you know that the same Lord is going to come in the same way? Now why would they tell them that? What if, if they're not going to be there, who cares? Amen? And uh, so they force this rapture in, and, it, and what that does is it makes the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials all fit if they if they do it consecutively like that. But the attitude is no one ever actually gets in deep and examines each one because after all, again, who cares? If we're going to be raptured out of here before any of this, who cares? Why study it? Why worry about the keys of the kingdom? Why worry about... Uh, the root of Jesse and the offspring of David and all the things that's mentioned in Revelation. If you know that, hey, we're in the Laodicean age, the trumpet's going to sound, we're going to go out, planes are going to crash, and now we don't have to worry about a thing. We're going to be up there in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'd like to find that in Scripture too. I'd like to find, not the marriage supper of the Lamb, but this whole idea of being in heaven during the seven years, when at the end of Revelation is when it's said it takes place. Amen. This dispensationalism is a farce. And it leads to it leads to men believing in different ways of being saved. Well, brother, that's ultra dispensationalism. Or just like hyper Calvinism. I tell you what, if you'd stay out of Calvinism and you stay out of dispensationalism, you'd never have to worry about becoming hyper dispensationalist or hyper Calvinist. Right. Amen. Um so anyway, I, I want to show you a few things here. Um, <clears throat> look at Revelation 16. Now, wh- what, I'm, what am I talking about right now? It, what we're about to teach is nothing like the dispensationalist. And I'm going to use Bible here. I'm not going to use a Clarence Larkin chart. Okay. Now, I'm not saying Clarence Larkin wasn't saved. I'm not saying he wasn't a nice guy. I'm not saying he didn't love God. But he's wrong. Amen? Because his chart does not fit the Scriptures. When you get in detail with these guys, they always find something else to do. Am I right? You find detail. You know, one guy said, uh, Hey, uh, can you show me in the Bible that, that the timing, any verse that even hints at the timing of a rapture being before the tribulation. Can you find that verse in the Bible? And boy, they'll go all around and after about 20 minutes, they'll say, uh, well, you know, I got this thing I got to be at. Uh, where, oh, at that place, uh, this guy I know. They got to go. Amen. They don't get into detail. Well, I want to get into a little more detail. In Revelation 16, if you look at chapter 1 or verse 1, It says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So what's taking place here? The seven vials of wrath. Now according to the dispensationalists, that's way down the road. Amen. Uh, A lot of arguments on when this stuff takes place. Okay. I say if you just read the Bible, you don't have to argue. But then I I want to jump over and I want you to look at verse 12. Now we're talking about the sixth vial of wrath. Now watch what it says. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water there was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now we're going to get into all this, okay? So I'm just showing a point, so don't let your mind go off to this. We're going to get to it. Verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now watch this. Look at verse 15. We're talking about the sixth vial of wrath. Now if you're a pre-wrath rapture guy, we're about to uh, stun you. 
If you're a pre-trib rapture guy, you're already stunned and you've turned off this recording. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now you tell me, who in the world is he talking about? Who are the servants of God that watcheth and keep their garments? Who is that? That's saved people. That means there's saved people there. Now the dispensationalists, especially if you get to the Peter Ruckman ilk, they'll tell you that you're saved by grace and at the rapture, the day of grace is over. And then when you get going into the tribulation, if you're going to be saved, you have to stand up for Christ and be beheaded for Him. The Holy Spirit's been withdrawn from the earth. That's what they teach. You say, how do you know? I went to Bible college. Well, that's the one you went to. I went to four. Come on now. If you ever go to an independent fundamental Baptist meeting, boy, they rant about the pre-trib rapture and all that stuff, don't they? They rant about it. It's insane. There's people here. We're talking about wrath being poured out and there's people that the Lord tells, hey, be patient. Watch. Keep your garments. Keep them white. Amen. We're going to preach on that this morning. You know, seven times the word patience is used in the book of Revelation. We're going to preach on that this morning. Seven times. Amen. We're going to look at it. Turn with me. Kind of keep your hand there in Revelation. Uh, Because we'll be going back there for sure. But if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Now I wish, to be honest, I could provide a little more context. Now if we took uh, an all day Saturday seminar on this topic, I would. I definitely would. And I'd have your little workbooks and everything and we'd be taking all kinds of questions and so on. But I don't have that kind of time this morning. But I want to show you something. Look at Luke 21, beginning in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now has that happened yet? By the way, it's the same thing if you uh, refer to... Matthew 24, Mark 13, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, Revelation chapter 6. That's the sun being uh, darkened and the moon turning to blood. And all right. That hasn't happened yet, has it? That's right. No, but it's going to. Now watch. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Isn't that exactly what we just read in Revelation 6? And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Now who is that? Who is he telling to look up? That their, because their redemption draweth nigh. He was standing there talking to his disciples. As a matter of fact, if you look uh, specifically, it was Peter, James, and John. Yeah. Well, we know they're not alive today, and it didn't happen in their days. So who is he talking to? He's talking to us, his church. That the foundation was the apostles and the prophets and then evangelists and now pastors and teachers. Amen? That's who he was talking about. So guess what? We're still here. We're going to see the wrath. We're not appointed under wrath. Amen. Isn't that right? That wrath is going to be poured out. I mean, think about it over there in Revelation chapter 9 when this king comes up out of the bottomless pit and he brings all these devils up with him that are are big as lions, look like locusts, teeth like lions, hair like women, tails like scorpions. And who do they sting? Everybody that has the mark on their head. 
Amen? For five months or five and a half months, whatever it is, we'll look at it when we get there. But they don't even touch the Lord's people. We're not appointed under wrath. Someone automatically will think in their mind, it's the tribulation, it's the wrath of God, we're not appointed under the wrath, so we won't be here for the tribulation. Well, I hate to tell you, but the Bible's very clear about us suffering tribulation. Maybe it doesn't point to the great tribulation, the way they'd like it to be all bundled up, but God's people have always suffered tribulation. Why are we different in America that we think we're not going to go through tribulation, especially what I guess we would liken as the tribulation. Yeah. What makes us think that? I don't get that. Of course, I think the two doctrines of pre-trib rapture and easy believism have come together that all these millions of Christians in America are going to take the mark. And you say, what do you mean? Because they're not Christians. They're tares in the kingdom. They're goats. And they've, easy, they've done some easy believism. They got saved on the bus to get some candy or whatever. Their life is still a mess. They still haven't had anything done to change their desires, their lust, their pride, or anything like that. And uh, they've been taught, well, we're going to be out of here before the Antichrist, so you ain't got to worry about it. And when that mark comes along, they're going to say, this can't be the mark. It can't be. I know it resembles it. It's a forerunner of it, but it can't be the mark because after all, I'm going to be raptured. That's, that is deathly, isn't it? That is... That is just poison. That is ungodly. Anyway, so when I'm talking about the timing of the sixth seal, I don't time it out like the uh, dispensationalists time it. All right? So the next point I want to bring up, going back to Revelation 6, is that I want, if we're going to look at the timing of this, of these three eras, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials. I want to start by following the obvious textual clues. Amen? A lot of people will read Revelation, but they won't study very deeply because it gets a little tiresome. And then you start comparing earthquakes and stars falling and, and all kind of stuff. And it just gets very laborious. And then after all, you're not going to be here anyway. So nobody ever teaches it that I know. But let's look in Revelation 6 and verse 17. And there's a reason the Lord put this in. It says, for the great day of His wrath. Now that's interesting. What, did did y'all see this with me? Am I making this up? Am I imagining that that's the sixth seal? That, that somewhere within these seals we saw the day of wrath? From the Lord? Are y'all seeing that there's a correlation there? Amen. But wait a second. I thought the wrath was the seven vials of wrath. It is. They happen together at some level. Amen? You're seeing why I believe this. Amen. Okay? The wrath takes place at the sixth seal. Now, let's get a little bit more correlation here with that. Go with me to Revelation 15. I want to show you verses. Uh, let's just read chapter 15. And they're talking about the vials of wrath here. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now, by the way, you're going to learn that that victory they got was through their death. Verse 3, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. 
And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, let's go right into chapter 16. I'm providing some context here is all I'm doing. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath upon, of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Who, who is getting this wrath? Those that have the mark of the beast. Why just them? Because we're not appointed unto wrath. Amen. Verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of, dead, of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over the, these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. <clears throat> and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Now, I don't know if that's not the vials of wrath, and that's not the wrath of God, then let's just throw the whole thing away, because I don't know what else it is. Amen. Now, look... At verses 16, I've already read this other, okay, but let's go to verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Now, do y'all remember over in chapter 6, who were they hiding from? The face of the Lamb and from his throne. Ah, uh, we're seeing it here. Yep. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Did we not see that in Revelation 6? Did we not see in the sixth seal the great earthquake and heaven open and men seeing it? Is this not the same exact thing? Absolutely it is. We see a correlation between the seals and the vials that somehow some of it takes place at the same time. Amen. Anyway, verse 19, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Now get this, we get a little more detail. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. That's about a hundred pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So what do you think these men did when hundred pound hailstones started falling? They hid themselves in the rocks and the caves. Does it sound like the same event to you? Well, it does me too. We have something in common. We ought to... Go out and get lunch sometime. Amen? All right. So we already see that there's a correlation between these seven seals and these seven vials. Now at the very end, I'm going to break down to you where I think they might fit in. But it won't be perfect because there's so much overlapping language. And the way John writes it for us, he's just telling us what he sees. And some things may not be the same. Some things definitely are the same. We just don't know, okay? So I can't be exact, but I can kind of give you an idea where I think. And that's the hub of what I'm going to be teaching from here on out. I'm always going to go back to uh, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials being together. 
uh, because not, not perfectly together, one versus one versus one, and they all match, then two, two, two correlates. No, no, no. But as we see that this is a short time, and all the things that are in Revelation fill in gaps of that time and gives us things that's going to happen, like the sealing of the saints, the calling out of the Jews, the man of sin, the Antichrist, we call him. Not only an Antichrist, the Antichrist. All of that, the devil's persecution, all of that, uh, the, the fight against God's people from the devil and their ultimate victory. We're going to see every bit of that within the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials. So I'm going to keep going back and say, now remember, remember, and then once we start interpreting tough chapters like chapters 11, 12, and 13, we see they fit somewhere in there. It's not something that, you know, maybe that happened 100 years ago. Maybe it's going to happen. No, no, no. We can see that it all fits in a very short time. Amen. So now you see the purpose of learning this. I think it matters. <laughs> Amen. Of course, I think everything in the Bible matters. All right. So what are we done? We said, well, we're not like the dispensationalists. We cannot agree with. We cannot even uh, stand the thought of a seven, then seven, then seven. We can't deal with that. So we started by following the textual clues. And we saw in the clue from Revelation 6 and verse 17 that somehow seal number 6 and vial number 7 are the same thing or happen at the same time, even though it's to different people. And I'm going to show you why I think all that, okay? But now, let me ask you this. Where do the trumpets fit in? I mean, we got to ask that, don't we? Now, what's, what's strange is I have to teach it this way because we've heard all of our lives, seven seals, then seven trumpets, then seven vials. And that's the way God presents it. And he's showing us different views of the same event for different reasons, for three different reasons. Amen. But we've heard all of our lives the, the dispensationalist view. And we had all the charts and you pay the highfalutin evangelist to come in and you have a special meeting and ooh, and you say, sell Jerry Jenkins books, you know, and all this stuff that I have to just take it piece by piece and analyze it for, for us folks to go, wow, that was so wrong. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, what about these trumpets? Amen. Where do they fit in? Okay. Uh, not where do they force in, where do they fit in? See, the problem with dispensationalism is that they have to force stuff here and there. They can't find, because they don't understand local church and men being here in the tribulation, uh, they can't stomach uh, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb being in any other place than in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ uh, for seven years while wrath is being carried out on planet earth. None of that is true. You read about the people, the judgment seat of Christ, read about any time people are being judged by Christ. Where did it take place? On earth, not in heaven. I, I hate it when it's that simple, but anyway. <clears throat> so where do the trumpets fit in? Let's go to chapter 11. I will be honest, chapter 11 is my most dreaded of all the chapters. Not, not that I dread the Word of God in any way. I love it. I, I love the challenge. But these two witnesses are enough to just make me just lose sleep at night. Okay? Uh, a lot of discussion of what these two witnesses are, and we'll deal with that when we get to it. But let's look at chapter 11 and verse 15, and I want you to notice... And the seventh angel sounded. Okay, so I jumped right into the seventh trumpet. That's really not a problem for us today because I started at the end of the seals and then I went to the end of the vials. Now I'm going to show you that the end of the trumpets is all the same event. Okay? And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. 
And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. Oh, look at that. Wait a second. Did y'all see that? Wait a minute. Wait. We're in a trumpet here. And they said his wrath has come. Yeah. Well, that just correlated those two, didn't it? Yeah. All right. So anyway, verse 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Hold on. Let's don't run past this. How is he going to... How is it the time of the dead? It's the time of the dead to be raised again is what it is. It's the resurrection that we look for. Amen? Yeah. Watch. Watch this. And thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, that reward would be given unto them. Now, if this is way over here at the seventh trumpet, and it's during the wrath of God, and there are rewards about to be given to the saints, you tell me when the judgment seat of Christ takes place. It cannot be up in heaven some distant place while this is going on on earth, and it just told us it's going to happen. See, all you got to do is read it, huh? Amen. Amen. But we got so much gobbledygook in our head from listening to dispensationalists that we can't we can't interpret it. It's it's like we've been given the Alzheimer's of Bible reading. Amen. That's what dispensationalism is. You, you you're saying, I'm gonna let me read my Bible, and they say, Hold on, let me give you this. And then now you're like foggy and okay, let me let me look at what uh, at what Tim LaHaye says. Let me read a book and have a conference. Uh, what's Bible college say? Right? Let's continue here. Verse 19. And the temple of God was open in heaven. Now, how many times are we going to see that? Well, we've already saw it, seen it on the seventh vial. Now on the seventh trumpet, we're seeing it again. Back at the sixth seal, it was hinted because they fled from the face of the Lamb. It's the same thing. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in His temple the ark of His testament. By the way, just to let you know, that ain't the, that, that gold ark covering acacia wood with gold right. uh, cherubim on it. That thing is nothing. Right. That thing is a shadow. Right. We're going to see the real ark. Amen. How do you, I can't imagine it. Amen. We're going to see the real ark. I mean, if we're gathering and we're hiding and we see that, we're going to be like, y'all are in trouble oh, yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, that's what we ought to say. We go up to get beheaded. I just want y'all to know y'all's in trouble. Yeah. Amen. Y'all's in trouble. You better repent right now. Is that hell? Is that hell? Get ready to run. Yeah. You're in trouble because we're going to see it. It ain't just this blip, blip, blip. Oh, Jesus is on earth. No, heaven opens. This is a campaign. Yes. And it's Christ versus Antichrist. And I got bad news from Mr. Little Antichrist yeah. with his little one eye and his little gay self. Yeah. I got a little problem with him. He's going to lose quick. Oh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> whoo. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake yeah. and great hail. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't say hail. It said great hail. Now you think, well, I wonder what great hail means. Go back to where we were and it says it's a hundred pound weight hail. Yeah. I would call that great hail, wouldn't you? I mean, we freak out if we get it the size of a quarter. Oh no, my car, my roof. Look at this. And we take pictures of it, put it on Facebook. Can you imagine a hundred pound, a talent size hail coming down? hundred pounds, that's almost as much as I weigh. Watch it. <laughs> Are y'all seeing why I believe it's kind of, 
how, how they kind of happen at the same time. All right. Now, um, talking about this seventh angel here. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to let the Scriptures interpret the Scriptures. See, I like the look on y'all's faces. As I said, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Y'all are like, mm -hmm, oh, 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 oh. I already know what this is. Yeah, bring it. The Word of God is right. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to look at verse 51. Now I'm about to tie together some more stuff. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Who's we? Usins. Amen. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Boy, that's guaranteed, isn't it? We may not all die before Jesus comes, but we're all going to be changed when Jesus comes. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, look at the next phrase, at the last trump. Now, my question for the dispensationalist, how many last trumps are there? Amen. When the last trumpet sounds in the book of Revelation and the kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Christ. Is that not the last trump? Yep, that's right, sure it is. In a moment of twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. So didn't we just read in Revelation that it was the time of the dead, and there's trumpets and all that? We sure did. Amen. I'll stop right there with that. Turn with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And I want you to see verse 21, 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, boy, they can't get around that phrase after the tribulation. Nope. Amen. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Right. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and from one end of heaven to the other. <laughs> Now, let me tie together these events, okay? Let me tie it together. Good to see y'all, by the way. The seals are written for the church. So teach us to be patient. We look around and we see the persecutions and all this stuff. We're comforted because the Lord comforts us. And as we see these seals unfold, I mean, all of it's written to the church. All of it's actually written to anybody, but it's specifically for the church. The trumpets are judgments for the world to repent. He kept saying over and over, still they wouldn't repent. Still they wouldn't repent. Yep. Amen? During these trumpet judgments, their water turns to blood, all this stuff, and they still won't repent. The vials revealed to us, see, I'm, I'm thinking God did it this way for us to have a better understanding, is the wrath of God
carried out on these who won't repent. Though they take place together, I believe that's one reason God made it separate. And as we go through the book of Revelation, we will go back to these seven, seven, and seven all being somewhat together. Over in Revelation 6, let's go back. Revelation 6, verses 12 through 14. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her timely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. With that in mind, with what we just read, go over to Revelation 11 and look at verse 13. 11 and verse 13, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Look at verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in His temple the ark of His testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. Do you see? They're the same event. Then... By the way, what I'm doing is using the trumpets or or using the earthquakes to show the trumpets is all I'm doing. Then go to Revelation 16 and look at verses 12 through 16. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water there was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So this is telling us to stand. This is telling them to repent. And if they don't, wrath will be carried out on them. It seems like we're going to be going undercover because of the persecution. But yet, an angel, according to Revelation 14, will be preaching the gospel of God. An angel. Amen? Heaven will be opened. They're going to see it. Even though men will see the kingdom of heaven opened, they still will not repent. There's an angel saying, repent, 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 repent. Everybody's hearing it over and over. The judgments are coming along. Do you want a sign? Here it is. Jesus said, even if one came back from the dead, uh, they wouldn't listen to the word of God. Amen. So that's how hard men's hearts are. And it's going to turn around and there's going to be the wrath of God like nobody ever imagined. Now, I believe the seventh seal, basically, you know, we looked at the sixth seal, but I believe the seventh seal is basically the announcement of the seven trumpets. Go with me to uh, chapter 8, look at verses 1 and 2. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. I won't take you any deeper than that. I believe the seventh trumpet is the gathering of God's people and enemies. Okay? The seventh trumpet is the gathering of God's people and enemies. Go to chapter 14. It'll make a whole lot more sense as we go to it line by line and so on here a little bit later. Look at verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying, with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, 
for the harvest of the earth is ripe. People say, that's the rapture. Well, let's keep reading. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the winepress of the wrath of God. Okay? And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Okay, what's going on here? We see a couple angels here. The one angel reaped, but it didn't say what he reaped. And the other one reaped the earth to put them into Armageddon, which we will back that up when we get to that point. Now listen to Matthew 13 and verse 30. Just listen to it. I'll read it to you. This is the parable of the wheat and tares. Listen to it. Let both grow together until the harvest, the wheat and tares. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, we just saw a couple reapers here, didn't we? Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to be burned, to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You start putting together everything we're seeing this morning, and you'll find that the time of our gathering to Christ is right at the time of Armageddon. Now the verse, lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh, makes sense. The seven vials are poured out on those who have the mark made up primarily of Antichrist's army at Armageddon. And we received a warning as Christians right before that seventh vow to stay white, stay clean. Amen? Amen. So, I want to show now that these interlap. I know I went a long way to get to this point. I know people will say, what do you think? Where do you think? And I just write it on the board. Oh, that's good. It's interesting. Thanks. I want to show you why I believe it. Amen? And I hope I hope you believe it too now with all the evidence we just saw. Um, I mean, that's all we could do is look to the Word of God and uh, test the evidence with the Word of God. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm not going to draw out what happens at every uh, vial and all that stuff. But we have the seven trumpets. So one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Seven. We see at the sixth, uh, I'm sorry, the seven seals, uh, and I'll just go ahead and put seals out here so we remember what we're talking about. We remember seeing at the sixth seal basically the return of Christ. The seventh seal, the reason the Lord does it this way, and see, His ways are not our ways. Right. Okay, we would think, well, there's six, and then there's seven. Well, seven basically all He does is open up the trumpets to us. Amen? And we see that the seventh trumpet happens at the same time as the sixth seal. So the trumpets, let me write it out. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to write it that way. That won't be visual enough. I believe, based on the evidence, that at the sixth and seventh seal, that time frame is when the seven trumpets take place. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the trumpets. I mean, after all, with a comparison, it seems like this is a long era of time, and that's a shorter era of time. And it takes place somewhere right in here. Okay? I can't be exact because the Bible doesn't make it exact, but God did tell Daniel that knowledge shall increase. Amen? As we get toward the end. Then when it comes to the vials 
of wrath, um, I believe it takes place sometime between the fourth and fifth seal. I really can't be exact there. Okay, but is this confusing the way I've got this written up here? Okay, vials. But the point is, when it gets to the sevens, they all take place at the same time. Turn with me, we'll close with this. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. This is a little bit long. I'm sorry if I hope you're okay with that. But if I didn't get this point across, we would be, you know, kind of flailing as we try to go through Revelation. Hebrews 12, beginning of verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom now... We receiving a kingdom, it means we already have this kingdom, okay? We receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So that means stick by the stuff and hold on because it's about to get crazy. Amen? We'll stop right there. God bless you. Thank you for your patience.